Look, I think the radical left have played a role, um, and you know, but they're a small group. And if if the liberals were you know vigilant, they would get nowhere. You can have a sensible norm against racism, but to have a taboo against it means something else. It means this is sacred, and suddenly you can push that sacredness. You can say you mispronounced a surname, you're racist, and you know you can get bumped off uh, a committee or or you know let go or cancel in some way, or you've got this black mark you can never get rid of. What's going on here is just hyper, hyper, hyper sensitivity to the imagined feelings of the most sensitive possible member of a minority group that's been sacralized. This idea that woke's fading away as a fashion is, is completely wrong-headed, but we're not going to have, nor do we expect, uh, everybody to have the same wealth or, or exactly the same job. Now, when it comes to women and men or black and white, somehow that's out the window and we are in this kind of identity-based, what I call cultural socialism. It's gonna be a less pro-free speech society in 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's my prediction, that if we don't do that and we go down the road of enforced equality and quotas, we are gonna immiserize ourselves culturally. So it's gonna suppress freedom, truth, beauty, merit, all of these other things that are very important to a flourishing society are going to be suppressed. Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. And to get the full episode and all my other episodes, go to nickdixon.net and sign up for just £5 a month, which is like the price of about half a pint of beer now in London. So please go to nickdixon.net and you help us keep this whole thing going and pay all our producers and it's much appreciated. And today we have another excellent guest. He is the author of a new book called Taboo and in America it's called The Third Awakening. It is of course Professor Eric Kaufman. Thanks for coming back and doing the show again, Eric. Great to be here again, Nick. This is, uh, you know, our second home, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, I've got the new book uh, which is coming out uh, on the 4th of July here in Britain but pre-orders are already possible. Um, and of course, I've got the new course on Woke, uh, which is open online, available to anybody, and a new uh, London master's degree in the politics of culture running next year. Okay, cool. Excellent. We, we like to get the plugs in at the start just because the last bit's paywall, so it's good we got all that in. And people should definitely get your book. I've read a decent chunk of it. I was telling you before, I'm annoyed that I haven't read all of it because I'm so... High in conscientiousness, as Dr. Peterson <laughs> would say, but I'm like, I'm angry I haven't read it all, but I've read a decent chunk. And one of your interesting points is that um, you cite the anti-racism taboo of the 1960s as not exactly the start of woke, because you say that goes back 100 years or more, but a kind of a key moment. Now, it's that kind of North American centric view. And why is that the key moment and not, for example, I don't know, French postmodern theory and all these things that other people cite? Yeah, I mean, I guess a big message in the book is that all of the intellectual um, ideas, the Marxism, the post-Marxism, the post-modernism, I don't think that's the driver. Uh, those are very cognitive. Uh, those are important when, when we're explaining the kind of slogans that are being used. But what's driving this emotionally is what I'm interested in, right? And Jonathan Haidt is, is, has this idea of moral intuitions that, you know, we aren't rational, we rationalize something that our unconscious is driving us towards. This idea of the elephant and the rider, the elephant is our unconscious that pushes us in towards something and then uh, the rider just tells a story I don't know if you've heard of these split brain experiments where they have have a sort of divider between your eyes and somebody will do something funny over here and this side will you know will laugh and then they'll say well why, why are you laughing and then he'll say oh you just said something funny and actually the, the interviewer didn't say anything funny so we kind of make up stories right. about why we do what we do and so I think what's going on here is um, the driver is that we have this emotional landscape which has been prepared since the mid 60s so what that means is certain particular groups and their stories have become sacred and so the emotional charge is set to 10 out of 10 for race and maybe it's charged at 7 out of 10 or 6 out of 10 for women. And it might be 8 out of 10 for gay and, and lesbian and trans. Um, for class, it might be down at 1 or 2. Those mm. charges can change over time. The sort of symbolic attachments, the strength of that emotion that is directed towards these particular victim groups can change over time. And, and so and the flip side of that is, of course, hostility towards whoever's seen as oppressing white, male, 
whatever. Mm-hmm. Whoever's seen, and maybe gender critical feminists, whoever's seen as the oppressor, you get a negative charge. And so I'm interested in that positivity and negativity towards these concrete groups. And that sort of gets me to the definition of woke, which I use, which is the making sacred of historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups. That starts with that race taboo, which made race sacred, black Americans sacred in the mid-60s. And then that magic is borrowed by a number of other identity groups, indigenous, and then feminists, and then gays, and then trans, right? So that is where I think the power comes from. All of the stuff about post-colonialism, post-modernism, you know, the Marxists failed, so they went from class to identity. I think that stuff is secondary and is largely a bunch of intellectual somersaults that don't really drive things that much. All right, so you're saying it's a kind of post hoc rationalization of an emotional impulse, which makes sense. And some of the elite theorists said things like that, like Pareto, that really that's all that ever happens, and politicians just justify their choices later after they've already done them. You know, So I, I, can, I, could, I could go for that. But one interesting thing is you, you blame the liberals rather than the, the Marxists, and partly for that reason that you've just mentioned. But you say that... Um, Rather than a purposeful Gramscian Marxist march through the institutions, I maintain that modern liberals, not radicals, are largely responsible for our cultural malaise. So I was trying to work this out, how far you blame the liberals, because it seems like you do, but then later you you, you sort of imply the reason they're to blame is because they have allowed this, they've been sort of, uh, they've been powerless against the far left flank. So, which it seems a more a more of a claim I've heard before. So, how far is it the fault of the sort of left liberals, and how far is it the fault of the radical left? Well, look, I think the radical left have played a role, um, and you know, but they're a small group. And if if the liberals were you know vigilant, they would get nowhere. And so, actually, it's like saying um, you know if Bono, you know if if you two come on stage with their electric guitars and they can't plug them in anywhere, very few people are going to hear them. And so you have to look at the sound system, the amplification, as being more important, arguably, even than a few radicals. And and what I'm talking about, left liberalism as the kind of sound amplification system. But it's not just the amplification system, you know, which means that even a few radicals can move mountains because of this terrain that the left liberals have created. The left liberals themselves have innovated in a number of different ways. And so I also talk about the kind of evolutionary ratcheting radicalism that comes out of left liberalism. And a good example of that is emotional safety and speech codes and um, harassment law, which is, you know, it's now the case, there have been cases where, you know, if you criticize the supreme leader of Iran in an American company, that could be seen as Islamophobic, right? (laughs) And you might be essentially uh, told to shut up. So that's that's an example of, that's nothing to do with Marxism. It's nothing to do with the cultural Marxists saying, oh, that's creating a structure of racial oppression, and it, this is like the structure of class oppression, and therefore we must overthrow it in revolution. That's not what's going on here. It is just hyper, hyper, hyper sensitivity to the imagined feelings of the most sensitive possible member of a minority group that's been sacralized. And that sensitivity process... If you trace that back, it really goes into this kind of humanitarian liberalism that begins with the liberal progressives in the early 20th century U.S., people like John Dewey, uh, who are kind of sympathetic to the plight of what were then European minorities. But that kind of sensibility of, which which is in some ways a good thing, a lot of these things do some good before they go too far. Um, And that humanitarianism then seeps into psychiatry, and so we're going to affirm all your feelings and that then leads into emotional safety and trauma and bullying, all these kinds of things. Mm. And so I'm more interested in that sort of therapeutic, what, what Rod Dreher calls therapeutic totalitarianism, yeah. arising out of this sort of inch by inch, step by step, uh, incremental ratcheting that comes out of left liberalism. Now, of course, similarly, what happens with the race taboo in the mid 60s, that's not a Marxist thing. It really isn't. It comes, the civil rights movement, in fact, is not really driven by Marxists. I mean, it's a whole range of people, including uh, people who are Republicans who are involved in that. I mean, the Republicans were more likely to vote for civil rights than the Democrats. Hmm. And now, they're again, a good thing, but where does that race taboo come from? It's it's coming out of that left liberal tradition and not out of the, the Marxist tradition. In fact, a lot of Marxists initially were pretty, they thought that this whole 
race equality stuff was a bourgeois thing and nothing to do with the class struggle. Right. That makes sense. We, on the therapeutic culture, we actually had uh, Dr. Ashley Frawley, who is a Marxist. She was very against that culture. The idea that you're sort of you're sick is your default position and the government can cure you or the, the prevailing culture can kind of cure you of your, you know, your mental health problems and there's something wrong with you. Yeah, definitely the therapeutic culture is an issue. And the other thing you mentioned about Iran reminded me of a story we did yesterday as we record on GB News that um, certain indigenous artifacts will not be shown to women. Did you see that one? Yes, that's because, right. The because Pit they're Rivers so Museum. sacred. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were not meant to be shown to women in their initial conception or usage. And so we'll honor that by not allowing women to see them. So race trumping, proving your point, actually, race that's trumping right. gender. Well, that was, yeah, and that was what I sort of, I have a piece in Unheard actually making that point this morning. But the, yeah, the point, what's interesting to me about that is that it shows this sort of, it reveals the totem pole of oppression, the hierarchy, with race at the top. That was the original taboo. And then it spread to feminism, LGBT, etc. Now, of course, trans versus female. Female falls below race. It also falls arguably below trans. So when it comes to a contest, trans versus gender critical feminist, gender critical, f critical feminists go under the bus. In this case, women's sensibilities go under the bus, and, and it's the racial ones that really count more. Which, it, which I find interesting because there is this argument you run across from some liberals, you know, sensible liberals who say, you know, we're against identity politics. People should just be individuals. And, and one of my points is, is sort of John McWhorter's argument in his book, Woke Racism, where he says, this isn't really about tribalism so much as who is hurting who. So are women hurting black people by seeing that Igbo African mask, which is only supposed to be seen by men, right? And therefore, well, the sensitivity is is to race, and therefore, actually, we're going to have to hide that mask. Um, and, and that's what's interesting to me, whereas if you were a real feminist and you were really tribal about being a feminist, you wouldn't allow that. And of course, there are feminists who say that's a bad idea. But then again, there are many women who will say, no, we're going to defer, we're going to step in behind the more disadvantaged trans or black population because we have to step back in the progressive stack and sort of defer. Oh, yeah, white liberal women <laughs> right. ruining everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I become a racist then when it comes to that point. But, um, right, right. <laughs> but um, that's interesting, isn't it? Because when you say, yeah, trans, as we know, does trump sort of being female, except now the so-called TERFs have fought back to the point where they're now getting some victories. But it's much harder to imagine that, isn't it, for race? Because imagine trying to push back against that and say, no, guys, we've taken this racing too far, which a lot of your book is about. But how does yeah. one go about that? Because it's the, the layman can hear, hang on, a man is allowed in a woman's changing room and men can destroy women's sports. And they can hear, see on the face of it how absurd that is. But much harder to say, guys, this racing has gone too far. Although we are seeing some signs in that the uh, constantly calling people racist is no longer working as well. That's become overused and absurd. But how do you start to push back on the on the so what you call the race taboo? Yeah, it's very difficult because these are taboos. I mean, it's like not urinating at the table. You know, these are powerful <laughs> social taboos, and there's a whole literature. We need to but, start there. Yeah, That's yeah. How... <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's a whole literature on these taboos, and, and they change. They're different in different societies. You know, like menstruation is a, is a you know you can't touch anybody if you're menstruating apparently, and um, uh, which which in in many societies is restricted to women, by the way. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so there are these different taboos, and they kind of emerge almost through a, a law of the jungle, like someone asserts. That that's offensive, and then as long as everyone steps back, then they can push that line, push that line, and then at sometimes taboos go away. You know, homosexuality, sex before marriage, some of these other taboos have have withered, but there've been new new taboos that have emerged, the more progressive ones. Uh, yeah, and I think one of the messages of the book is until we actually make those taboos into just norms. Yes, that you know racism is there's a norm against racism. It's not a good thing. We don't like it, but this very sort of tripwire based sudden death your your career's over no second chances that has to go and and it's a very black because that's a very black and white simplifying view of the world that tries to engage a disgust reflex rather than have a proportional so i think if and my, one of my worries is we can have a pushback on dei in in american tech firms and we can have harvard getting rid of mandatory diversity statements i mean that's great my worry is as long as these taboos are in place that seedbed is there for another surge. And of course, one of the themes of the book is that we 
we really, you know, this idea that woke's fading away as a fashion is is completely wrong-headed in my view. I mean, I think in the main, and so I'm looking ahead and saying, we've trimmed this bush back and it's going to have another surge. And mm. it, it just depends who lights the match. It's, it could be a video of, of a white cop killing an unarmed uh, black civilian. Something like that will ignite another awakening at some point in the future because the underlying emotional topography remains what it was. And so we haven't reformed that. And until we actually get at that, that structure of emotions and char the moral charge behind these different groups, the sacredness, until we actually start to pare that down, we're going to keep having problems. Which seems a very difficult process, given that emotions are by nature irrational or can be irrational. You know, how do you how do you suppress a, a you know collective emotion? That seems almost impossible. It seems like something would have to happen naturally to me, just thinking yeah. about it out loud. But um, when, why, and when you say taboo, it's interesting you chose that word because just thinking out loud again, I'm not sure this is in your book, but when you mentioned taboos, some of them are good. Some taboos are good, aren't they? When you said there's sex before marriage, that was perhaps a decent one. Adultery, not having constant abortions, obviously anything to do with children. You know, the certain parts of the left are trying to break down a taboo mm -hmm. about, you know, basically paedophilia. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on YouTube, but that's uh, disgusting. So there are taboos that are there for a reason. Or even things like slut shaming gets criticized a lot as if it's anti-women. But presumably that arose because women actually in the past needed to be married to make sure they were secure in society. If they were known to be promiscuous, that was going to harm that. So in a, in a way, wasn't it there to protect women? So there were taboos mm. that were there for a reason. Maybe the race one was there for a reason as well and just went too far. But is there a difference between conservative taboos that are there to keep order in society and just these leftist taboos that seem manufactured to me sometimes? Well, I think, I, I mean, in a way, they're, they're the same phenomenon. But I think there's a distinction between a norm. You know, you shouldn't make elitist comments or denigrate poor people, working class people. I mean, that's a, there is a norm. Now, it's just that that's a weaker norm than the making racist comments norm, which is a much stronger norm. Um, and the, the ones, and so I'm kind of talking about turning the volume down on some of these things. Uh, so my, my issue with taboos is this fact that they're so black and white and it's just to the max. I mean, we can have norms. Norms, I distinct, distinguish norms from taboos. So you can have a sensible norm against racism, but to have a taboo against it means something else. It means this is sacred, and suddenly you can push that sacredness. You can say, you mispronounced a surname, you're a racist, and you know you can get bumped off uh, a committee or or you know let go or canceled in some way or you've got this black mark you can never get rid of, um, and that's what I mean is this sort of real power this cultural power that mm. comes from that um, that taboo and that's what I'm kind of very concerned about is I just think and now how does this happen of course these taboos are installed by a whole system of myths symbols exemplars heroes stories so mm. you know Jim Crow slavery, um, you know, the Holocaust is one, uh, you know, all of these stories, which are the sacred stories of our culture. And every child knows about Rosa Parks now, probably in Britain as well. Um, so these are these are the things that that really are, you know, make the culture live and make these bring these taboos to life. We would need to have uh, counterbalancing stories and myths and symbols and heroes and exemplars to counterbalance that. So one idea that I have, for example, is if you're going to teach about British imperialism, and this is where you can you saw in the Reform Manifesto, right? If you're going to teach about British imperialism, you have to pair that with teaching about some non-European form of imperialism. It could be the Mughals, it could be the Ottomans, it could be the Aztecs, but we need to have this in context. And what that does is it's just going to turn the dial down on British imperialism as this grave, uh, exceptional sin and put it in context. And similarly with genocides and conquest. Yes, the Americans conquered uh, indigenous populations, the Australians, but um, let's put this in context. All land is stolen land. It's not just the United States. And here we're going to look at another example, the Comanche against the Apache, which was essentially almost effectively a genocide. I mean, but nobody knows about it. And, and there's a similar examples from New Zealand, it's the Maori, what they did to another indigenous group. That, I think, is important, or that the indigenous Americans owned slaves, had, had their own indigenous slavery. All of that stuff is necessary. 
not because it changes the fact of American slavery, but because it turns the emotional dial down. And so what I think we need to do is start trying to have countervailing stories. We know, you know, most kids don't know about the excesses of the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward in China, the num millions that were killed. Again, that's what I mean is sort of rebalancing the stories we tell so that we can take some of the steam out of this morality play that, you know, whites and men are, are the evildoers of history. Yeah, I think you say woke is based more on mythos than logos in the yeah. book. And, and yeah, and you mentioned these stories, even, even, even mentioning Rosa Parks, as far as I know, she was a sort of stand-in because the original woman that didn't want to uh, stand was not as, as optical, you know. And then you think of George Floyd. I mean, I don't want to get banned from everything, but probably, possibly a drug overdose was saying, I can't breathe before he was on the ground. Can't say this because he's now an iconic uh, mythical figure. Right. So we need somehow like countering... We need counter stories. I don't know. We have to have a mythology around Derek Chauvin. I'm not sure. I mean, no, no. <laughs> no, but it's partly about just pointing out some of the skepticism and the criticism to take away this romantic halo around these people. And, and by the way, I, I should say, um, Coleman Hughes, you know, obviously has, has gotten in some hot water, but he said, well, look, I don't think Derek Chauvin should have been convicted on the evidence because they didn't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he, he did it because there are alternative explanations that were not uh, removed. So, you know, Coleman, you know, obviously as an African-American can say that, and but he sort of pushed that case and said, look, I mean, legally there was pressure on the jurors. This was not a fair trial. Now, who knows where that debate's going to go, but uh, obviously the guy's in jail for a very long time. Um, but that's an example of where, you know, really these taboos and sensitivities are so powerful and irrational in a way. We should be able to step back and say, here's the evidence. You know, yes, we've got a norm against racism. We've got a norm against elitism and anti-religious prejudice and all these other bad things, but it's not just you know, you, you mispronounce somebody's name or raise an eyebrow. I don't know if you heard that one. That was considered a microaggression, raising an eyebrow. Really? Um, but yeah, so, <laughs> so so that's that's where we need to get to is, like, for example, 70% of uh, Zoomers in the U.S. believe that um, the indigenous, the native people lived in, quote unquote, peace and harmony before the <laughs> Europeans arrived, right? So, <laughs> again, part of this is maybe about providing facts to let the air out of some of the, the airbrushing of history and romanticization of uh, particular sacred groups. Okay. I do want to get into young people, actually. Yeah. But maybe I'll wait and just ask a couple of other things first I wanted to ask, which is, um, I mean, you, you say... So I'm struggling with how far this comes from guilt and where that guilt comes from. You say left liberal conviction, not cowardice, accounts for the power of council culture and critical race, gender ideology in organizations. Uh, so then I start to think, do the libs actually believe this stuff or is it guilt? Is it complacency or is it actual conviction? That's why I'm struggling a little bit. And and on, if it is guilt, where can that be traced to? Is it is it, Chris, is it Christian in origin? Is it this strange outgroup preference that that white people seem to have, which you kind of alluded to before, we were talking about sort of white liberal women. I mean, and, and or is it from education? Because as you're saying, we don't learn about the Ottoman Empire and all these other things, and we don't learn that we ended slavery. We just learn that we tend to learn that we're the evil ones, that the only ones that did it, and all this absurdity. So, what what is the source of that sort of unique Western guilt? Well, I mean, there is a whole area of study called sociology of emotions. We learn which emotions to express and feel given different situations, uh, and, and it changes by culture. So I think this is learned. I think this is a, a construction, uh, not entirely, but so for example, when you know black people got the vote in the US in 1870, when women got the vote in 1920, did you suddenly have male guilt? No, right? You didn't have male guilt. When, when Harvard and, and the Ivy League got rid of their anti-Semitic uh, you know, quota, uh, the Jewish quotas, was there suddenly this guilt on behalf of, of non-Jews? No. So only in certain situations, the civil rights movement, which actually largely concerned the South and what was going on there, and suddenly the guilt was nationwide. That seems odd. You would have thought there should be, if it was really just about we have sinned and we feel awful, you would have thought the ending of slavery you know, and, and the granting of votes for, for black Americans should have been the time when you saw this surge of guilt. It wasn't. So I think there's a lot of ideological control over when guilt is, is encouraged in the society. 
Um, and it happened very quickly. I, I think, I mean, Shelby Steele in his book, White Guilt, you know, as an African-American who lived through this process, I mean, it really was this very sudden thing. One summer, Paul Krugman describes, you know, everyone, the, the, the black coachmen on their front gates were painted white. You know, just all of a sudden this happened. So I don't necessarily, I think what was happening, you could see that left liberalism was gaining momentum, but then all of a sudden this movement captured the imagination and suddenly out of that story, of course you had television that had suddenly emerged and just the vividness I think of it just suddenly moved the emotions and it became sacred. Mm. Uh, and that was, a, I think, the, what I call the big bang of our moral universe. Mm. And everything now revolves around that in a way, that sacredness. And was there a, a class and status element? Because I've noticed even in, in my anecdotal evidence that when I'm told I'm sort of white privilege and all these things, even though they can explain to me why it doesn't mean what I think it means because I'm stupid, it, you know, but you can still have people... <laughs> You're you not ha- stupid, no. No, but you, know, you can have people like, you know, you say, well, I'm not privileged, whatever, and then you go, no, it doesn't mean that. Read a book. And you're meant to be educated into their way of thinking, whereby someone can say that a, a homeless white person still has white privilege, and their claim is, no, no, you don't understand because it's structural and they won't experience ra- problems because of the color of the skin, which, by the way, isn't even true because they'll be discriminated against in any number of job applications. Right. And also, so they literally will experience discrimination. Anyway, but I've noticed, uh, coming from an ordinary state school, and from a family who, you know, my dad's side particularly, was sort of generations of poverty, I don't feel uh, that I have ever had this white privilege. And I don't feel guilt. I feel mainly anger. And whereas, whereas posh people at posh universities, they feel guilt and it becomes a status symbol. So is there a class element as well there? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in the book, I am less persuaded by the sort of Rob Henderson stroke. Uh, I mean, quite a few books, you know, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, a whole bunch of others really talk about, you know, this, there's a status thing, a self-interested thing. Now, I think that's true, but I think it, it's secondary. Like, once these values are seen as the prestige values, then self-interested people will herd towards them, and people who want promotions in academia will herd towards them, and, and, and people who want grants and sell books will. So I don't think that's the important thing to explain. I think it sort of comes second, and there's a whole... Uh, sociology literature around this. Uh, Max Weber, a famous uh, sociologist, said, you know, it's like the, the switchman metaphor. Um, the switchman who's moving the track is culture, and then the locomotive is moving for self-interested reasons. So, you, so the cultural person switched the track over, and it became about, you know, sig- sign- signaling your white guilt on race and or your male guilt or whatever. And then the self-interested train just barrels down this other track. So yeah. I kind of want to explain the switch, man. I'm not particularly concerned. I, yes, I understand that it's there are certain benefits from a self-interested point of view in pushing this now. But I, I want to explain what the sort of, I still think this is largely a, a, a true belief thing. The other thing I should say is, yeah, so the, the, some of the data in the book where I've done surveys of people and talked about hypothetical scenarios. Let's say, um, you know, a quota for women and minorities in terms of hiring in your organization. Would you support that? And actually, you get quite high support, you know, like pushing 50% uh, in whether that's surveys of academics or surveys of, of people who aren't academics, actually. Uh, there's just a lot of support for anything badged. Uh, you know, we're helping the, the oppressed minorities mm-hmm. Uh, especially around race, gender, sexuality, and so equity. You know, how can that be a how can that be a bad thing? How can more diversity be a bad thing? How can right. more sensitivity be a bad thing? And, and that's kind of my point around left liberalism is they don't do an Ibram X Kendi and say you know we're structurally uh, white white supremacist and therefore we need affirmative action quote hard quotas. What they say is we're too white and male and, and we need more diversity. Except it's always open ended, so it's never enough. And so that's why the left liberal winds up in the same place as Ibram X. Candy and says, yeah, actually, I want to read Candy because he's more or less, they're more or less saying the same thing. It's just the, the liberals got there by saying we need more, more, more. And Candy's got there by saying we need this percentage. But ultimately, they wind up in the same place. Right. And I'm going to ask about that in a sec, but it, I, you just when you were talking there, I thought about the, the fact that it's so hard to make the counter argument because it's often counterintuitive or you need to look at stats or think it through. The, the, the left makes these emotional arguments, as you say, they spread it via social media and it's kind of all over because it just, it sounds right, it sounds appealing and why would you be against that? It's very hard to put that back in the box, isn't it? When it comes yeah. to, I always think of just simple things like like quotas. If you used to just have 
the best people on a panel show, or whatever it was, or some sort of yeah, something on TV or something like that, or in comedy, we used to have we had these panel shows. No one would care for a long time that they were all straight white men because that was the majority of people doing comedy in the UK, mm -hmm. for example. Then it had to be quoted. And once you've said, I know it has to be X amount of different races and genders, it's very hard to go back from that and say, no, no, we're going back to all white men again. Because yeah. now it looks like a choice. Before it was just a meritocracy, but now it would look like an aggressive choice to undo that and you would look like a, a big racist. It's very hard to go back, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I mean, this sort of gets to these bigger arguments in the book about, you know, in, in economics, you know, if we were to say, you know, everybody should have exactly the same amount of money and wealth, you know, you'd say, well, that's actually communism and that's going to take away the incentive to work and uh, we're all going to be poor. And so that's what kind of killed the argument around equality on the economic front. Not killed it entirely. I mean, so, so the accommodation was, yeah, we'll have a welfare state and we want to in increase opportunities for people from disadvantaged backgrounds, but we're not going to have, nor do we expect, uh, everybody to have the same wealth or, or exactly the same job. Now, when it comes to women and men or black and white, th somehow that's out the window and we are in this kind of identity-based, what I call cultural socialism. Anything less than perfect equality, you know, whether it's in engineering or it's entrance to Harvard or whatever it is, anything less than whatever their percent in the population represents some kind of structural form of discrimination. And, that, and so we are extreme on this. We're kind of cultural socialists. The question is, how do we actually roll back from that? And part of the answer in my book is we need to come up with something like we did in the Cold War to counter communism, which is to say, actually, there is a natural rate of inequality that comes from people making choices, having different talents, and we have to allow that to express itself in a way. Um, and that if we don't do that and we go down the road of enforced equality and quotas, we are going to immiserize ourselves culturally. So it's going to suppress freedom, truth, beauty, merit, all of these other things that are very important to a flourishing society are going to be suppressed. Um, and that's kind of where I'm hoping to sort of get the conversation is we need this counterweight to the cultural socialist narrative, something that says, no, cultural wealth is damaged by cultural socialism. So we need to have, we can have some equality. And by the way, I almost wouldn't be as annoyed is, is if, if they said, well, we need 50% women, not because that's morally the right thing to do, but because of the politically those ideas, identities are important. It's a bit like 50-50 Catholic Protestant police recruiting in Northern Ireland. Like no one's saying that we must do that because that's morally right, right? Because they are absolutely equal in every way. They're just saying we've had this kind of war. We need to actually, you know, because of the peace agreement, we need to recruit on a 50 and it's a, it's a pragmatic thing. I think that would be kind of less, in a way, less of a problem because you're not actually undercutting the entire moral order. Mm. Okay. Um, and with, I mean, with communism, I mean, the old Cold War example, I suppose it destroyed itself by its own in, uh, absurdities and, and horrors. So and how, I suppose, how does that happen here? Because we see the absurdities the horrors are a bit more subtle and gradual. Is that the mm. problem, that it's just harder to show? I mean, you could, you could show. I mean, obviously, for a long time, you couldn't show it because it was so sort of hidden. But you could, you could show that the Soviet Union was bad. <laughs> it's, right, it's harder right. to show that this stuff is bad. Is that the, is that the problem? Because it never quite collapses. Well, well although let us, let's not forget that a lot of people thought the Soviet Union was an economic miracle and was the way forward. Really, there were people saying that up until the 60s. You know, it was really only past the 60s that this, this narrative, what we grew up with, this idea that it's an economic basket case and, and you have no choice and it's, it's a design. I mean, that, that really came later in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what's happening, I think, with the woke stuff, I have a, a whole chapter on downstream effects of woke. So woke essentially means you can't say anything that will offend a member of a totemic sacred minority. Right. So if, for example, you say we need to deport people and someone accuses you of, you know, of being insensitive because immigrants uh, are, are more likely to be non-white than white and therefore it's racially coded and therefore it's a racist dog whistle. Right. That can shut down the correct policy. So we suddenly you can't deport. Uh, you can't control your border properly. You, you immigration's out of control because nobody wants to sort of be accused of being a racist. That's kind of what's happened under Biden in the United States. They didn't want to do the remain in Mexico policy. They didn't want to actually deport, all of which has led to signals to, you know, people traffickers and 
So you've had this incredible wave of illegal immigration. Now, similarly, we could talk about crime, right? Um, what did Black Lives Matter do to, you know, black on black crime and to the number of black lives lost? What does it, has it done to black neighborhoods? Or the idea that, you know, you can't um, stop and search because there might be a race disparity. You can't exclude pupils from class because there might be a, a, for bad behavior because there might be a race disparity. Uh, you can't get rid of affirmative action because that would be insensitive to black men. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That woke has, because it shuts down debate, we can't actually fix problems. And so they sort of metastasize in society. Maybe we can't recruit a military or a police force because we don't have patriotic citizenry, uh, or maybe because wokeness has so devalued these occupations or it's permeated these, these organizations. All of these things have impacts. Um, and so I think this kind of, one of the things I think that comes out of this is tanking trust, growing polarization, is again coming out of uh, woke. So woke means that, for example, everyone has to wear a mask, but you want to go out and protest for Black Lives Matter. Oh, well, we'll suspend that, right? Mm. So suddenly, trust in institutions, on those institutions, crashes amongst Republicans, or trust in universities has gone down amongst Republicans. And so the whole polarization that's kind of making society in many ways more sclerotic and unworkable comes out of woke. So there are mm. all these kind of, but you're right, they are kind of downstream second order effects. And, you know, they have a number of causes, but they are effects of woke. And that's what I think is the kind of equivalent of communist misery um, that, that's coming upon our societies. Yeah. Although, well, there's two things I wanted to ask there. Just one is on immigration. Could you just mention it there? That's one where we, we are seeing pushback again. Though. So wh why is that happening? When you say we can't even discuss immigration, which has been the case for a long time, why is it with that example, we can suddenly discuss it now in Europe? It's suddenly a massive issue. Here it's a massive issue. Reform are talk saying this should be the immigration election, and finally, all, all the parties are having to acknowledge it to some extent. So why, why, how come that's suddenly happening? Well, okay. So what I would argue there is that um, woke essentially was why it was very difficult to discuss, and, and it is still difficult. But woke made it very difficult to discuss immigration levels. What that meant, of course, was the mainstream parties and media had a sort of taboo on this, but it meant, therefore, that there was unsatisfied demand. So political mm -hmm. entrepreneurs like the AFD in Germany or the Sweden Democrats, giving example, Sweden Democrats, 2014, the um, Swedish mainstream right party minister uh, of the interior, I believe, tried to raise the issue of immigration levels to Sweden and was more or less attacked in the press as a, and, and by other opposition politicians as a racist. So he had violated this taboo. He quickly retreated. Mm. Next year, the Sweden Democrats were in on 12.5%. Why? Because the, the moderates had vacated this entire area that the people cared about. And so what essentially woke, a version of woke political correctness, which I think is intimately connected to woke because it's based on the sort of race taboo. Um, so what you actually had was political correctness constraining the Overton window, making it impossible for mainstream politicians to address the demands of the electorate, and that creates populism. Right. So the, and then once the populist gets in, once the AFD and the Sweden Democrats get in and they surge, the, the mainstream right says, uh, you know, actually, we too are going to have to talk about this. And all the parties then follow the populist right. And to some degree, we're starting to see that in, in Europe as well. The center right has, has been doing that to some degree. Right. So that's how you kind of push taboos back. Um, but let's not, you know, let's not take this too far. If you look at Nigel Farage, yes, he's talking about immigration. This is the immigration election. Whenever he's, he's asked about immigration and why it's a problem, he still goes with, oh, pressure on the NHS. He's not talking about People discom people's discomfort at the ethno-cultural shifts, which is actually the main reason why this is driving uh, voters, right? I mean, so, so he's having to focus on the acceptable reasons why you might be against immigration, not the cultural reasons, which actually, if you really look at the data, are a bigger driver. Yeah. The, the, in the past, he, he got in trouble for saying things about Romanians and stuff. Well, that now seems sort of relatively quaint. But he then <laughs> he he now talks about skills, pressure on services and right. so on. Yeah. Yeah. And he even talks about net zero immigration, which if we had 600,000 people 
leave would still be 600,000 people in. So that's still a huge number. They've toned yeah. that down a bit lately because that's actually people on the right are going, well, that's not enough. Net zero still too yeah. much. I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, the net, the net migration thing, obviously, if someone comes in as a student and then leaves as a student, that's one immigration, one immigrant. So uh, it's right. still a good measure. And I'm not, it's not quite true to say 600,000 is, is people staying in Britain. I mean, a lot of them are just circulating, but, so, okay. but still. So I still think it's a useful measure. So I would sort of defend the, the net zero sort of argument is at being, if you get to that point, you mm. know, yeah, I mean, that would be, be a start. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't get a controversial, but yeah, I mean, so, I mean, and, and on your other point, yes, that they, 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 it's interesting about the immigration taboo and other taboos. And, and I think you might have said this in your Jordan Peterson interview, but you need someone like Trump to come along who just doesn't recognize the taboos. And it's yeah. like, we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay. And by the way, they're rapists. Oh, right. <laughs> I don't know if I can yeah. say it on YouTube. But then, you know, you just go, they need, there's that supp the supply and demand issue, whatever you call it. There's that people are desperate yeah. to just hear that, even if it's quite obscene at times. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think you need to sort of go where Trump goes in terms of talking about rapists. But what I do think is that, you know, politicians who are willing to sort of take take the axe of being accused of being a racist, that's a very important. And, and if politicians aren't getting that, they're not doing their job. At least conservative politicians aren't doing their job because they're not pushing these taboos back uh, to where they should be. Now, it's still w worth having a taboo or at least a strong norm against certain things. So George Wallace, you know, believed in segregation. He had a, you know, he had a populist movement. I think it was right for the mainstream parties not to go to where George Wallace was on segregation. But on immigration, that's a different, it's, it's, it's a completely different issue, actually. Um, and I, I would like to see populist or conservative politicians starting to raise these cultural questions more. That's the next thing, the next domino that needs to fall is to actually say, this is really about what kind of, you know, people have a certain way of life. They, you know, the ethnic composition does matter. It's not, it's not like you want to have a white only country. It's what you, what you're talking about is slowing the rate of change so that people are comfortable, allowing for assimilation to occur, which actually takes several generations, actually. We know in the U.S. it took three or four generations for the Southern and Eastern Europeans to basically melt into the, the rest of the uh, population. So these things take time, and we need to have a pause for that cultural reason. Mm. That is still beyond the pale in a lot of countries. Right. And when you talk about that slowing the pace, that's a kind of classic sort of, um, it's a sort of liberal argument. I mean, it can be kind of mocked by conservatives saying, I think, and other people, even Michael Malice says something like uh, conservatism is liberalism doing the speed limit or something like that. So is it is it just the pace of change or is it or is it just a fundamental, you know, distinction between le left and right? I mean, do we just want slower change or do we actually want that change? And it makes me it reminds me of a question in your book. You say woke isn't dead, but we can move beyond it and incorporate some aspects of cultural equality. And it made me think, do we really want do we want that at all? I mean, which parts of it? are legitimate and need to be baked in in the way you're saying. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. I mean, I do, you know, I think a certain amount, like if it was the case, let's say that, you know, old boy networks of, you know, let's say white up class or whatever, through those networks were hiring people they knew and, and that's how they were getting the law practice and, and, and recruiting people or it was in Oxford, you know, whatever it is. It is certainly possible that social networks uh, you know, and people hiring based on who they know does result in certain people being excluded. Of course, the way to address that is to say, okay, no, we want to have a broad pipeline. We need to advertise this openly. You know, maybe you take pictures and names off the off the application. So there are kind of facially neutral ways of addressing that, which will bring, uh, you know, will actually bring a bit more diversity in. But naturally, not because of a forced target or quota where you discriminate against actively against white people. And, and similarly, I think with regard to, you know, I think there's there are a lot of areas where we need to be tolerant. You know, one of the one of my arguments is that we should replace all of the Pride Month, Black History Month, all of these days, what what uh, Ed West calls the uh, the new uh, calendar of saints, right, in, in, in Western workplaces that. We should replace all of that with one day called, you know, International Toleration Days. And, and, but not allow that, just even for that one day. So we've now 
kind of collapsed all of these days into one, which I think is a huge gain, a huge win. But the next thing, of course, is to say, well, it's not just race, gender, and sexuality. We're also going to look at other dimensions of privilege, you know, such as, you know, intelligence, such as looks, such as extroversion, all of these other things which we know matter a lot, even whether you're born first or second in a family actually has a big effect on how much you're going to earn in your life. Well, let's actually bring all of those other things in class and, and, and bring all of that in and have one day and we're going to have toleration and appreciation for privilege and that'll be one day. Mm. Um, I, that's what I would be in favor of that because <laughs> it's, it's fair enough. But I think right now the problem with this whole moral landscape and, the, and this sort of uh, sacredness is that what the sacredness means is A, taboos around certain groups and not others, uh, but B, it means the, the centrality of LGBT, of race, of feminism, let's just say. The, the centrality of those symbols is so high because they are the sacred ones. You know, yes, we care about the disabled and the, you know, people who've had a, who were disfigured in war and people who are, you know, fat even. I mean, the fatness thing, you know, it's, it's not really a major, yes, you body positivity, but that's not really got the same airplay that, that these other things do. Um, and so part of this is, we have to decenter race, gender, and sexuality in the culture more generally. And that's part of this desacralization is these things are part of something that I'll call being tolerant. And we're not going to give you special status and special billing. We're going to decenter this in the culture. I think that's got to also be part of this. Hmm. Yeah, because you, you point out in the book how it is quite arbitrary. Why don't we care about these other things as so much? No, one, no one's... No one's saying, oh, you're not allowed to just like tall men. You know, yeah. you occasionally might see a man complaining about it online or something. But, you know, yeah, you can. there's all sorts of areas where you can be brutally just sort of, uh, you oh, know, yeah. Darwinian. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> oh, it must be over six foot or must be whatever. And, yeah, and as you say, the body positivity, they try, but no one really buys it. And just they kind of go, come on, Lizzo. Yeah, yeah. And it just doesn't work. But other ones do take on to take off, as you as you point out. And Lionel Shriver, who you reference in the book, and we had on the podcast talking about her book Mania, where she imagines that it's a satire, where she imagines a world where being uh, you're not allowed to call people stupid, and it's bad to be high IQ. And we don't really do that. We do it in a, a little bit in certain ways by giving dumb people a job because they tick some other box. We do it a little bit here and there, but. But yeah, it's, it's quite arbitrary why we pick some and not others. Yeah, exactly. That is a choice the culture makes. It selects certain things and it, it omits other things. And, you know, a good example that I like to use is, you know, if you go to the Ivy League and you look at the black students and the Hispanic students, you'll notice a couple of things. I mean, first, I think it's about 60 percent of those black students are not actually American blacks from descended from American mm -hmm. slaves. Uh, they are from West Indian or West African backgrounds. That's not an issue. These are people with absolutely no connection to that experience and the so-called so inherited trauma of that experience. Um, no one makes an issue of that, which is remarkable in a way. And then likewise, the Hispanic students, you know, they're going to be more European origin than than indigenous in their sort of, you know, they're not, they're going to be towards the European end of the Latin American spectrum, right? right. Doesn't matter. That's not an issue. Or, or you know, uh, the African-Americans, maybe they're lighter shaded by you know, african -American. Again, that's these are not things that the system makes sacred and cares about. Uh, right. And that's very revealing. These are all about, it's all about selection and choice uh, as to what we make sacred. Yeah, yeah, that is, that's an interesting part of the book. And, and I'm just wondering, I've got a few more questions. We don't have, we've yeah. got maybe 10, 15 minutes, and I just want to make sure I ask the best ones. Because um, we've got the young people, which I do want to get on to. Yeah. Um, but I also really want to ask this thing about cancel culture was really interesting to me. So you talk about cancel culture flowing up from the bottom rather than being top down in an emergent authoritarianism. That was interesting to me because I've just interviewed Oren McIntyre and his in his book, The Total State, he argues the opposite. He argues that the, the sort of, uh, what is it, the liberal global managerial state that's taken over uh, it, it, as soon as that had mass democracy, i.e. voting, it started off with manipulation of the mass media. Then it, with social media, it became necessary to manipulate everyone's view and to monitor what they were saying at all times because they were a potential voter, they were sort of political agent, and it became in, uh, important to monitor what they weren't saying. And I thought of the example, it's not actually in his book, but of the black square on Instagram. You had to post the black square on Instagram during the the Black Lives Matter thing, or you were racist, even if you didn't post it. Mm. I mean, obviously, I didn't buy into this nonsense and didn't post it, but many people did. Even people I knew privately disagreed with it. 
And that, but that could go into your race to be. That could go down and prove your point. But that's an example of the 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 total state becoming aware of everyone's views at all time and it's important what you post and what you don't post therefore he sort of argues it is top down and cancel culture becomes a mechanism for the state to to protect its own power and to generate you know people are going to vote for them or at least toe the line and say the right thing and observe the cultural i suppose you would say taboos but why do you think therefore that cancel culture is an organic bottom-up thing instead yeah, I mean, this really gets to a kind of a key debate uh, in this literature, which is a bur burgeoning literature and, and I think a worthwhile one. It's a bit like, I guess I liken it to something like evolution. You know, do you see the evolution of higher life form or, or the, the existence of higher and lower life forms? Do you see that as something intentional and designed or do you see it as emerging through this process of evolution, through natural selection through mutations and so on. And, and it's that second, that's sort of the, the second explanation is kind of my explanation for woke. Mm. It's more like COVID. It's a virus that people catch and spread. Uh, you know, it, it became virulent at some point and spreads. Now, you do have super spreading institutions like universities, for example. All right, that is the end of the free episode. But if you want the full podcast, go to nickdixon.net for all the extra content, all my articles. That is my substack, nickdixon.net. And we need your help to keep this whole thing going. Keep the lights on, this amazing production, hiring people, etc. NickDixon.net to support us. It's £5 a month, which is about the cost of some sort of fancy latte in London. Or as a slight discount if you get the yearly option. Or it's just 5 quid a month. So we'll see you on NickDixon.net. And thank you very much. <laughs>